Assalamualaikum. Good morning, and we are continuing on with another clinical skill demonstration video, and this is this time it's the torch examination, and we we'll, we are going to talk about both the adenexal examination and the examination of the eyeball. Uh, both of them are done with the torch. Torch examination is a very simple form of examining the eyeball, but it it allows you to collect a lot of information. Uh, and it, if, if done properly, and once you've mastered it, mastering would mean at a level of an undergraduate, somebody who's been through a clerkship, you will be able to reach a comfortable diagnosis of all the disease entities that you're expected to be competent in dealing with by the time your clerkship ends. It's not a difficult assessment, but when, as, and I'm sure you've gone over the introduction to clinical skill videos, the most important thing to remember is your eyes will never see what your mind doesn't know. So if you're not specifically looking for things, your eyes will just refuse to see them even if that thing is lying right in front of you. So um, torch examination basically uh, encompasses um, examination of the author at next side. Next side is things that are surrounding your eyeball. So for example, your brows, your lids together with your lashes and this lacrimal drainage area. The examination of the eyeball is the examination of the conjunctiva, the external structures, basically structures that are visible with a torch. That is your cornea and conjunctiva. Uh, remember, your cornea is not covered by conjunctiva. Conjunctiva begins at the limbus and it covers the sclera. Uh, you can also look through the cornea because normal cornea is transparent and you can look at your iris and pupil. Remember, we're not going to do pupillary reflexes right now. That's a different skill, but you can at least have a look at the pupil and through the pupil, the lens, and then finally, an interior chamber depth. Why is interior chamber depth important? The, it'll sort of come up later when we are doing uh, the second theme, which is the, the red eye. But we'll, because this is a part of the eyeball examination, we will learn how to do interior chamber depth. Um, so, Again, it's the same seven components that are true for any clinical skills that you do, not only in ophthalmology, but everywhere else. And the special prerequisites for this test are you need a torch and you need a comfortable area where you can examine your patient. Uh, if you can alter the illumination of the area where you're examining the patient, that's even better, but generally you won't need to do it. Uh, at times when you're trying to pick up a very specific sign, sometimes you feel that if the room illumination, you know, it's better, but it's not necessary. So any room which is comfortable together with a pen torch that's working and you should have your own pen torch. Don't expect us to give you pen torches because really it's so much cheaper than a stethoscope or even the head mirror or even I think the reflex hammer and it's not that difficult to get one of the a torch and try and get one with a incandescent bulb rather than a lead bulb because it it has a light that is more comfortable for uh, the patient uh, or whomever you are examining so first we'll do examination of the adenexa and once this will be followed by a clinical skill demonstration and you will see how this is done um, practically, but when you are examining the adenexa, you do it basically with the eyes open and eyes closed. And when you're examining with eyes open, the first thing you would like to see are your brows and are your brows at the same level. And simply what you do, you compare the uh, the upper points or the topmost point of, of both of the brows and just draw an imaginary line between the two, like so. You don't have to draw a real line, an imaginary line and see if both of them are at the same level. Brow asymmetry would mean that maybe you're using your frontalis muscle to open the eyes or maybe something is wrong with your levator muscle, but those things will come up when we do specific diseases. What to record, how to record, we'll tell you, but when you're opening the, uh, when you're examining the eye, uh, eye with, the, with the eyes open, the first thing to check is the symmetry of the brows. Are they at the same level? And that is done by drawing this imaginary line. The second thing you want to note are any scars or swellings and when you see scars, also check for discoloration or hair loss. Scars would mean surgery or trauma. Swellings would mean inflammatory processes, tumorous processes, edema. So those are important to note. How to actually describe a swelling is given in your clerkship manual, and you can just uh, go over it from there. It's not that difficult. It's pretty easy to understand. And then specific patterns of hair loss that you might see in certain endocrinological disorders. When you examine your lids, 
and you examine them first with your with your eyes open and here you and obviously when you are uh, examining uh, the brows you're comparing for symmetry and then you examine each brow uh, individually for scar swelling or hair loss the same is true for your lids with the eye open first you are comparing the two and what you do is you check for symmetry and symmetry would mean are both of the upper lids at the same level and you simply do that by again drawing an imaginary line between the topmost point of between the two lids and they're sort of approximately you know at the same level here <clears throat> so now you're comparing between the two now you are going to be examining each individual eye I ocular adenexa and the first thing that you see is are the lids at an appropriate level and what that means is that the upper lid is supposed to cover the upper two millimeters of the cornea so you can't see the superior limbus obviously you can't measure two millimeters but at least you can say uh, that the superior limbus is covered so that's uh, a normal way of uh, that's how where the normal level of the upper lid is and obviously you're going to do this in both eyes the second thing you do is to check for the position of the lower lid and the lower lid is going to rest at the limbus. The limbus is the junction between the cornea and the sclera. So the upper lid covers the limbus, the lower lid rests at the limbus. Then you're going to check for the direction of lashes. The uh, uh, lashes in the upper lid direct outwards and upwards. In the lower lid they are directed downwards and outwards. So you're just generally checking if there are any lashes that are not in this direction, maybe they are misdirected or they have turned inwards for diseases that we'll do in the future. Then the other thing that you see is how close is your lid to your eyeball and your, your lids are supposed to be flush against the eyeball and that is simply done by checking uh, how close the lid margin is to the eyeball. I'll show you other pictures. Um, as to how this appears, but it's very easy when you're sweeping a torch across the eye, as you'll see when we do the demonstration of this video. So you check for symmetry, you check for the levels of the upper and lower lid, then you check for directions of the lashes and how well the lids are opposed to the eyeball. And then finally, look for any discharge or crusting on the lashes, which might tell you that there is an inflammatory process uh, going on. Discharge can be of various types. Uh, you can go over your clerkship manual, um, to have a very good overview of why that happens. And as you will do various diseases, we'll figure out uh, why certain diseases tend to produce certain type of crusting or discharges. Uh, so um, this is when you are doing your eyeball examination, uh, adenexal examination, sorry, with the eyes open. And now you do the same thing with eyes closed. And we are going to examine both eyes, obviously. And the first thing to do is to note this lit crease this eye has a very prominent lid crease. This eye, the lid crease is here, it's not that prominent. And this is telling you that the levator palpebrae superioris, the muscle that is supposed to elevate your lid, is appropriately inserting into the skin. So that's the first thing you, uh, you have to check for. Then what you have to check for, I'm sorry, my cat is going around here and there, so I'm just uh, making sure that she doesn't knock over anything. Um, again, note for scars and discoloration. Scars basically indicate trauma prior surgery. Discoloration would... Uh, can also indicate post-traumatic healing or other skin uh, depigmentary diseases and discoloration can also be the other way hyperpigmentary diseases like for example when you have uh, uh, issues uh, with your pigmentary cells uh, so you might have a nevus or stuff like that uh, so look for discolorations either hypo or hyperpigmented uh, then look for swellings, which might indicate uh, inflammatory processes, uh, tumors, or just edema, chemosis. And you look for that on the surface of the lid or also the lid margin, because remember your lid margin has hair or lashes, which are always associated here by sebaceous gland, which might also be inflamed. I'm sure you've heard of a sty or you haven't, or you might even have experienced a sty, so that you'll find here. So first, check for the crease, then check for scars and discolorations, then check for swelling on the surface, and then finally see if, not finally, then see if your eyes completely close. So you're not, you're not supposed to see any of your eyeball when your eyes are closed. And their condition, I'm sure you've heard of thyroid eye disease, uh, Graves' ophthalmopathy, in which the eyes uh, might not close properly. So you have to see eye closure, and finally, again, see for discharge and crusting on lashes. So five things that you're examining here. The first thing was brows. The second thing was lids with eyes open. Then you have lids with eyes closed. 
So now we are up to the examination of the lacrimal area and lacrimal area is the point where you have all your tears draining away from the eye. And here what you would like to see again are scars or discoloration. Scars again would indicate trauma uh, or, or surgery. Discoloration is also indicative of prior uh, heel scars. Uh, swelling. Swelling in this area is most commonly because of the lacrimal sac. Uh, and this is right here. And in this part of the world, South Asia, you have a lot of lacrimal gland, lacrimal sac swellings as we'll do when we do the nasal lacrimal system. So do watch out for uh, swellings in this area. Uh, they are not an uncommon site. And then you look for discharge and discharging fistula. So as this is the place where your tears are drained from the eye, most of your discharge tends to accumulate here. And if you have a chronic inflammation of your lacrimal sac and it's completely obstructed, it might sort of break out into the skin to produce a fistula. So watch out for these. And then again, as, as we discussed when we were doing um, examination of the adenexa with the lids open about the apposition of the the lids to the eyeball this is this is what's meant by it see how closely the lid is opposed to the eyeball they're supposed to be flush with it which is true for the lid margin as well as the puncti the puncti are the area where your lacrimal drainage system begins and they have to be flush against the eyeball and facing the eyeball so you can see this is turned inwards a little bit as is this they are pointing towards the eyeball because this is where they need to clear or start draining the tear film from. And it is possible to see these uh, when you're using a torch. Um, so what you're supposed to pick up are cross abnormalities in which the lid margin might be turned out whole and we'll do diseases in which, in which the lid margin is turned out so it is no longer in apposition with the eyeball. Um, so um, this is observed. Uh, and this is just a magnified picture and this is showing you how closely the lid is to the eyeball it's supposed to be flush against it and as the the puncti is sort of turned inwards towards the eyeball and they're also be, they're supposed to be flushed against the eyeball you're not supposed to pick up minor abnormalities which can't be picked up with a torch but gross abnormalities are but always be on the lookout because if you don't know you won't be able to see it your eyes cannot see what your mind doesn't know so again, this is just a magnified picture showing you talking about the same things. And this is just a better way of observing how the lid margin as well as the puncta are sort of uh, flush and very close opposed to the eyeball. This is observed. Uh, this bit is called the caruncle. This is a normal uh, structure. So this little swelling or this little spot, which sometimes people confuse as a growth in the eye, it's not a growth. This, this is a caruncle and it's, it's, it's in everyone's eyes. So you can look at your own eye, take a picture and then see it. Or if you have other people, I'm sure you have other people in your house and uh, you can have a look with the, with the camera or a torch and observe this. Uh, so when you are recording your findings and you have done your assessment, remember you have to examine both eyes and describe your findings for both eyes. This is given in the clerkship manual as well when, in, when, when it talks about the history and examination as to how to record. And it's also given with every clinical skill. So when you're, when you're describing your brows, talk about the symmetry. Are they the same level? Talk about do you see any scars and discolorations with it? Do you see any swellings? And describe the location of the swelling. The exact way of describing a swelling is given in your clerkship manual. So you follow that. And hair loss. Uh, in your brows. Then you examine your eyelids with the eyelids open, talk about are they at the same level comparing the two eyelids, are they at, uh, covering? Uh, are they individually at the same level, meaning are they covering the uh, the upper lids covering the superior limbus and the lower lids uh, resting at the uh, limbus. So the upper lid covers about two millimeters, so if it's lower than that it's not a normal position. If you can see the superior limbus then it's again uh, not at the appropriate level. Some might be confused between symmetry and level. So I'll just go back to this picture and tell you what I, what is meant by symmetry. Symmetry basically implies seeing are both of the upper lids at the same level. Now, if both of your upper lids were at a higher level than normal, they would still be symmetrical, but their level would be abnormal. So for example, consider that both of these superior limbus in both eyes was visible. Both eyes, both upper lids would be symmetrical because they are at the same level as compared to one another, but they are not at a, a normal level because normally the lids, the upper lids are supposed to cover upper two millimeters of the cornea and the limbus. And 
so level is for each individual lid. Symmetry is comparing the two lids. So if, if both of the lids were higher, they would be symmetrical, but they won't be at an appropriate level because the appropriate level is covering the superior two millimeter of the cornea. Or in other words, when you're doing a torch examination, the superior limbus is, is, is obscured or covered by the upper lid, while the lower limbus is visible because the lower lid rests at the limbus, as you can see here, and also uh, see in the picture when we were doing the lacrimal area um, examination. So this is what is meant by symmetry and level. Symmetry is comparing the two lids and level is then seeing each individual eyelid and seeing if it is at an appropriate level, i.e. for upper lid, uh, covering the upper limbus and covering upper two millimeters of the cornea and the lower lid resting at the limbus. So this is, this is the difference between symmetry and level. So we'll go back to recording. Direction of lashes is very important because there are diseases in which the, the, the eyelids, the lashes are either exaggeratedly turned outwards or inwards. Then you have how closely your uh, lids follow your eyeball and they're supposed to be flush against it. There are diseases in which your lids, lid margin tends to fall outwards in which your lid is no longer in opposition to the eyeball and it can also turn inwards as well. So you need to mention this. And again, discharging and crusting on the lashes. Discharge is a fluid thing, uh, liquid, mucopurulent, mucopurulent or mucoid, while crust are hard, uh, dry uh, uh, lesions. And there will do diseases which produces both. And you should look for them when the uh, with the eyes open and see if you can find any. It's much easier to see crusting, especially when the lids are closed. So with the lids closed, notice the lid uh, crease line, which is telling you that the levator inserted properly. And again, you are doing this for both eyes separately, so right, right, and left. So crease lines are telling you that the levator inserted into the skin uh, appropriately. Uh, which tells you to develop properly as well. Scars and discoloration, again, trauma surgery, swellings on lid surface and margin, because remember you have lashes, lashes have glands, those glands can get swell. So not only check the surface for swellings, also check the lid margins. Is the eye closure proper? Your eye, you should not supposed to see the eyeball with, when the eyes are closed. So you're telling the patient to close his eyes, not squeeze his eyes. And again, see discharge and crusting on lashes. When examining the lacrimal area, look for scars, discoloration, swelling, discharge. Again, because this is the area which is draining the tears, most of your tears tend to, discharge tends to accumulate here. And again, if you have any fistulas, which might or might not be discharging, happens in chronic uh, inflammation of the lacrimal sac diseases. And again, apposition of lids is again something that can be checked here because the puncti are here and sort of easier to see which direction the puncti are. And if you're not able to see it, just mention uh, grossly if the lids are uh, opposed to the eyeball. And when you do uh, this, practice this method at home, because this you can do at home, you just need a torch and you can practice all day if you want to. I'm sure you have others in the house who will allow you to practice on them. Uh, and you can see, uh, you'll start appreciating how the uh, lid is flush against the eyeball. And always, always examine both eyes, unless you're told to examine one eye in an assessment. And uh, now we'll come to the examination of the eyeball and examination of the eyeball would mean examining the structures uh, that are visible on torch examination when you are examining the eyeball. And the first thing, the most obvious thing is the conjunctiva. And when you're looking at the conjunctiva, look for discharges, uh, congestion, hemorrhages, swelling, and growth. Uh, and uh, as we'll do diseases, I'll show you different pictures of different discharges. So it's not that you won't see things, you will see things. Congestion, hemorrhages, swelling, and growth. So congestion is your vessels simply becoming congested. Hemorrhages is frank hemorrhage. Uh, so this is collection of blood, and this is an inflammatory process. Swellings, yes, conjunctiva can have swellings, and it can also have growth. And you need to observe all the conjunctiva. As you'll see in the video, you need to move the eyes and sometimes also gently pull the eyelids up and down, appropriately asking permission from a patient, making sure your, land, uh, your nails are clipped and your hands are warm. And then you start examining the cornea. You're examining it for clarity. You're examining the limbal area if there is any deposits in it. Limbus is the junction between the cornea and the sclera. And the cornea is supposed to be avascular, so if you have any gross aberrant vessels growing on it, you should mention those. And it is examined well with oblique and straight illumination. This is mentioned in your clerkship manual and also shown in the video. 
Then you have your iris and pupil. We are not doing pupillary reflexes. So don't do pupillary reflexes. Pupillary reflexes are not done with the room light open. We are not doing pupillary reflexes. Here we are just observing the iris for the uniformity of its color, especially between the two eyes, because it is possible in certain diseases that the color of the iris between the two eyes change. Although it is also possible to have slight variations in color between the two eyes. So you check, check the color of the iris of one eye and see if it is the same everywhere and then also compare the other eye and then look at the shape and size of pupil. Is the pupil round? Uh, is it normal? When you're doing a torch examination in your shining light, the pupil is about two to four millimeters, unless obviously it's dilated using drugs or there is trauma or something else going on. So you do mention the shape and size of pupil. Don't perform pupillary reflexes. Then you check the lens, which is one of the most important things that you do when you do a uh, torch examination. In fact, it's the most important thing that you're doing. And we are picking up whether the patient has his own lens, meaning the patient is phakic. And is the lens of a normal color? Normal lens is grayish green in color. And you should look at your own lenses. Uh, by, by I mean your own lenses is people around you who are your age or not the elderly. If you have young people as well as old people, you can actually pick up cataracts as well or changes in lens color or opacities as well. So a normal lens is grayish green in color. Uh, you can, if you want, and you've already started discussing the cataracts before you do this, it has a very good picture of what a normal lens looks like. Is the eye pseudophagic in which you have this glassy reflex? And where is the lens placed? Again, since we have started off with cataract discussion when we do this, we, you should be able to pick this up because there are pictures in it. This is relatively something slightly more difficult because you might not have somebody at home who has this. So this is a reflex that needs a little bit of practice to develop. And aphakia, you don't see much aphakia, means no lens implanted. So this is something that's uh, getting very, very rare. But at home, you can pick up or start appreciating normal, and when you come back to your clerkship, you can start appreciating this part. And if you have the elderly at home, somebody who's more than 60, there's a good chance that they might have an opacity in the lens. They might even have had surgery, so you might be lucky enough to see this as well. So the four things that we are doing when we are doing the examination of the eyeball is conjunctiva, and we are looking for discharges, congestion, hemorrhages, swelling, and growths. Look for cornea, which is the most important thing is cornea is its clarity. Cornea is supposed to be clear. And then limbal deposit is something that happens with age, especially it's called arcus analis. I know, I'm sure you know what it is. The cornea is avascular, which is normal. So if you don't see any vessels, that's good. Uh, when you're looking at the iris and pupil, the most important thing is don't start doing pupillary reactions. Just examine the color of the iris in the same eye. Is it uniform? And then between the two eyes, is it similar? And it's the shape and size of the pupil. Just comment on it. And the lens is whether it's his own lens, whether it's clear, or has a cataract, it is an artificial lens inside, or no lens. This you really don't get to see much. So I'm sorry I ch keep ch uh, changing my gaze because my cat is roaming around. She is sort of not happy that I'm not paying attention to her. So I'm just seeing if she doesn't knock off anything important. So this is just a close-up picture of showing you the same thing, conjunctiva, cornea, iris and pupil, and lens. And this is how you scan the conjunctiva in various quadrants, looking at the superior conjunctiva. And notice how my thumb is very close to the margin of the lid. Pull the lids from their margin after appropriate permission, making sure you use a horizontal finger the advantage of this is you don't jab your nail inside. So if, if there's no problem using picking it up like this, but picking it up like this ensures that your nail does not jab the patient irrespective of how well clipped it is. And pick up from the lid margin because that's the maximum way that you can expose the conjunctiva. Pulling from here is not going to pull the lid. So pulling from here is, and then pull from here. A pro, obviously asking appropriate permission. And this level of vascularity, these vessels, this is normal. This is how normal conjunctiva is usually vascularized. Sometimes you also see patches of discoloration like so. This is normal racial pigmentation. You should mention it because this is only in uh, dark colored individuals. So this is not something that you'll be discarded for if you're saying, yeah, there is a little bit of disc discoloration. That's fine because your conjunctiva is supposed to be a transparent and you see the underlying sclera together with conjunctival vessels. So seeing any pigment is something that you can mention on. And this basically comes in when we talk about <coughs> uh, the conjunctiva. So um, this is again, and uh, the finally then we come to checking the ATA chamber depth. So we have checked the conjunctiva, checked the cornea, then we have gone over our iris and pupil and the lens, and finally the anterior chamber depth, which to me is the most interesting thing. And 
the reason we are doing that is because your interior chamber helps drain the aqueous and the drainage of the aqueous is through something called trabecular meshwork then to the canal of Schlem and the trabecular meshwork is located in something called the anterior chamber angle which is the angle between the iris and the cornea and if the anterior chamber depth is less the aqueous doesn't get out of the eye that well. So we need to assess the depth of the anterior chamber and that is done by putting your illuminator perpendicular to the plane of the iris. So before I show you this picture, I'll show you another picture. Not this picture, this picture. So this is how you're putting your illuminator perpendicular like this. You'll see it when we do the clinical scale. And what you are trying to see is if your iris is nice and flat, you should be able to see the iris being uniformly illuminated. And if your chamber is short, you'll see this crescent here. This is called a uh, dark crescent. And this is happening because the iris is now not flat, it has raised. The reasons for this we'll do when we do angle closure. And this is something that you start seeing if your chamber is shallow. If your chamber is deep, your iris is uniformly illuminated. And the way to see it is if you're shining, you are always shining the light from the temporal side, the outside. So you see the iris, if you can see all of the iris on the nasal side, that's very good. If you see a shadow like this, that means the chamber is shallow. So I'll go back to this picture first, and this is what you're trying to see, that when you're, I'm shining the light from the temporal side, and I can see the nasal side of the iris very well. So the chamber is good. I can also see the color of the lens through air, it's gray screen, so no cataract, normal lens. And I see this dark band at the periphery. It's not in the cornea because the cornea is transparent, so letting the light in. So this is something happening at, at the level of, uh, the light from the iris in this region is not bouncing back. Remember, the iris is brown in color, so I should see brown here, whereas I see a dark ring here. So if this picture is a better demonstration of this dark ring. And if you see or practice this at home, you see this in every individual. And you also see it here, this dark band. Try and figure out why that is. The answer we'll get to, obviously, eventually, but you try and figure out that when you are doing this uh, interior chamber depth assessment, why do we get this black ring in normal individuals, which is at the periphery? So the iris on the nasal side is well illuminated when I'm doing perpendicular illumination from the temporal side, which means the chamber depth is all right. But this ring, why is this ring here? This ring I'm talking about, this is present in normal individuals. This is abnormal, this crescent shadow. And as you can see, I can see the iris in the periphery here. So this is something that's usually seen in, in normal individuals, not when your chamber is shallow and try and figure out why that is. So when you're up to the part where you're recording your findings, obviously you examine both eyes and you write right and left for right eye and left eye and for conjunctiva, you're doing, uh, you're recording these findings. Again, the type of discharge is given your clerk shift manual, you can see it from there. Your cornea, the most important thing is to see if the cornea is clear or not. Sometimes unless you have you have been practicing you would think that the change in the lens color is a change in color of the cornea but that's not true you need to be appreciative that if the cornea is clear that is why you're seeing the lens and the lens can only be seen through the pupil because every other part of the lens is obscured by the iris so comment on corneal clarity if there are opacities you need to describe them again it's given in your clerkship manual uh, limbal deposits, age-related arcus analysis is the most common thing. Cornea is avascular, so if you see blood vessels, do mention them. Uh, color of iris, don't perform pupillary reflexes. That's a separate test. We are not checking for pupillary reflexes when we are doing eyeball examination. Do not perform pupillary reflexes during checking of eyeball examination. Look for the color of iris between the two eyes and also see if there is any change in color of one iris, which if hyperpigmented may be due to a nevus or a freckle, if it's hypopigmented, there is not enough color that would probably indicate an inflammatory process. Shape and size of pupil, don't do pupillary reflexes, then you should look at the lens. Color of lens, is it a normal color? Does my patient have a cataract? And then the type, is it my patient fake it? Normal lens, then obviously the color comes in. Is it an artificial lens? And is, was the patient operated and no lens was put in? This is rare to see these days. Do anterior chamber depth, right? Normal or shallow? Shallow only if you see that dark crescent and always examine both eyes. Um, these slides are going to show you some common ocular adenexal and eyeball uh, anomalies that can be picked up on a torch examination. And this is the first picture. And I'll just give you a couple of moments to see if you can uh, pick up what's 
uh, what is not right or what anomaly can be seen. And if, if you look carefully, the brow over the right eye is higher as compared to the brow over the left eye. So this is a case of brow asymmetry and you see an asymmetrical brow, usually when a patient is applying a frontalis muscle effort to open the upper lid because something is either wrong with the levator palpebri superioris muscle, the one that helps to open the lid or it's nerve supply, which is coming from the third nerve. And, and this is usually thus seen in a patient who has stosis, i.e. an upper lid that does not rest at its normal position and uh, it's, it's lower than it what usually is, like for example, in this picture. Now this picture shows a very prominent brow asymmetry, but it, you also see that the, the upper lid is lower than its normal position. As we have already done, the upper lid covers the upper two millimeters of the, the cornea, and in this case, it's basically moved beyond the, the level of the pupil. So we're not actually measuring the amount of doses or doing doses examination. We are just, uh, you know, on a torch examination, we have picked up, oh, he has brow asymmetry. The left brow in this picture, the, the gentleman, is higher than the right. And there is a very obvious drooping of the upper lid as well. Uh, which might explain why the brow is uh, elevated so high because this patient is using the effect of the frontalis muscle to lift the upper lid. And because, you know, the frontalis does not really have a direct connection to the upper lid tarsal plate, which is the, the, the structure within the lid that gives it its shape and is, is, is something that you need to lift in order to open the eye. And, and since your frontalis is not attached to your tarsal plate, it doesn't, it really can't do a good job, but at least it is able to open the eye a little bit. So uh, brow asymmetry is generally seen um, together with asymmetrical lids. And even if you see the picture on the top here, the lid asymmetry does exist, but not as prominent as uh, in the picture below. So this is another anomaly that you usually see, especially in children, is a hemangioma. And unless you close the eyelid and you specifically look for those, you can miss these because sometimes they might not be very prominent, for example, in this case. Uh, this is uh, an example of misdirected lashes. And you can see the lashes have been turned inwards and are now striking the, the eyeball, the conjunctival part, and also the, the cornea. Uh, because some of the hair is, uh, the lashes are also sort of uh, striking the cornea, as you can see right here. So this, these are the things that you are seeing in ocular adenexa. And when you close the eye, another lesion that you can see are very minor swellings. And this is a clasion. A clasion is a swelling of your meibomian gland or your, your tarsal gland, the gland that produces the oily part of the tear film. <clears throat> and if you do not examine the eyelids with the eyelids closed, you can miss these little swellings. And finally, uh, deposits or crusting on lashes. And you can see this here, and uh, there is a disease called blepharitis. Obviously, we'll do all of these things. We'll see why the lashes turn inwards, why do you have crusting, how does dosis happen, what's a place on. We'll do these as the clerkship progresses. Right now, the aim is to show you how various lesions would appear um, in a patient when you're doing a torch examination. So crusting usually appears as white scales that are deposited at the base of the lashes. You might also see them on the lash as well, but mostly on the bases of the lashes, as you can see uh, in this picture right here. Uh, so we are moving on to the lacrimal area, and the most common thing you see is a swelling in the lacrimal area, and this is an active red swelling. Uh, you can see a lot of congestion around it. So this is an example of an acute dactriocystitis. Dactriocystitis is inflammation of the lacrimal sac. We'll do this when we do the nasolacrimal system, but this is how it would appear on a torch examination. These are various type of discharges that can accumulate in the medial area. Remember, the drainage part of your tear duct uh, is at the medial end. So all of the tears accumulate here and then they drain into the nose. So most of the discharge that you have also tends to accumulate here. And this is an example of a mucopurulent type of discharge that is also making the lashes stick to one another and also accumulating at the medial uh, or the lacrimal drainage area. 
So this is probably indicative of an infective process. Compare this to this, which is a mucoid discharge. Mucoid discharge is more white in color as compared to a purulent or a mucopurulent discharge, which has a greater yellower tint or a darker yellower tint. Another thing about mucoid discharge is it forms bands because mucus or the, the mucus in the mucoid discharge is very viscous and it forms these bands. As you can see, these bands between the upper and lower legs and bands here as well and discharge accumulating in the medial campal area. It appears slightly darker in, in color because it's contrasting against uh, the, the color of the skin. Um, so mucoid discharge is seen in allergic reactions. We'll do this when we do conjunctival inflammations. But this is how mucopurulent discharge would appear. This is how mucoid discharge usually appears. It forms strings or bands. And the patient actually says that I have uh, a very stringy discharge. Uh, if you have a patient who speaks English, they say it's a stringy discharge. If you have a patient who only speaks Urdu, they say Anko ke jale ban jate. It's like a spider web that forms in front of the eyes. So this is the discharge accumulating. This is the discharge on the, on the lashes. So these are various types of conjunctival uh, congestions. Uh, seen when the conjunctiva is inflamed and now we are talking about the eyeball and we are starting off with the conjunctiva and remember conjunctiva is this thin layer of membrane that covers over the sclera. There is no conjunctiva over the cornea. The, the conjunctiva begins at the limbus. Limbus is the transition zone between the cornea and the sclera and it covers most of the interior part of the, the, the sclera. Then it reflects onto the undersurface of the, the upper leg. You can go over this uh, anatomy of the conjunctiva just by looking at the first few slides of conjunctival inflammation. They are located in your learning resources, the red eye uh, conjunctivitis. You can go over the first couple of slides if you want to know a little bit more about conjunctival anatomy. You can also read it up, read it uh, from your uh, clerkship manual. So various types of conjunctival congestions, they can be diffuse and of various intensities as shown in the first two pictures here, or it can be sectoral, like right here, very close to the cornea in just one quadrant. And again, of various intensities as shown here as well. So the rightmost pictures are sectoral uh, conjunctival uh, congestions. The left two pictures are more generalized <clears throat> types of conjunctival congestions. And all of them, obviously you are seeing in an inflamed conjunctiva because congestion, i.e. dilated vessels, are seen in an inflammatory process. Um, two other things that you can pick up here are this little swelling on the lid. This is probably associated with one of uh, with the, the glands in the lips or, or, or surface of the lid, uh, this, the surface epithelium of the lid. And these are basically seen in, in allergic reactions, these little swellings right around the limbus um, and, and these will do when we do uh, conjunctivitis. But this, they're here to show you that you can have swellings around the limbus and varying degrees and various types of conjunctival congestions, generalized of various intensities, sectoral of various intensities. But the idea is do not miss other lesions if you just see a red conjunctiva because the mind of a student, especially undergraduate, focuses on things that are really, really abnormal and you start missing small things. For example, you would say, oh, the conjunctiva is red, but forget when you are describing, you see them, but your mind does not register them as important because redness is something that's really important. But you need to mention these because these are also uh, signs that you are picking up. And these are various types of conjunctival or subconjunctival hemorrhages. Uh, of various sizes and shapes. And this is usually seen in, in cases of trauma, but can also be seen in patients who are taking blood thinners uh, and especially uh, who are taking blood thinners and are straining too much, like cupping, sneezing, or lifting heavy weight. And in, in this last picture, you also see a little bit of a bruise. So this is probably indicating a trauma, somebody where people were fighting and he got punched into the eye. So you have a little bit of a hemorrhage in the uh, conjunctiva, which is called a subconjunctival hemorrhage, it is happening between the sclera and the conjunctiva, oh, but it is ruptured conjunctival vessels, but the blood is contained behind the, the conjunctival layer. And, and as you can see, 
and you can clearly differentiate it from conjunctival congestions because it makes the entire conjunctival details obscure. You can't really pick out vessels because there is blood right now obscuring these. And here you can actually pick up blood vessels that are sort of dilated which is easier to see if you have sectoral because you have a good contrast, even if you have this um, um, generalized type of conjunctival congestion, you can still pick out blood vessels which are dilated. But here you just have, you know, blood and it obscures all of the other conjunctival uh, details. You can't see those conjunctival vessels. So that's how you can differentiate a conjunctival or a subconjunctival hemorrhage from a conjunctival congestion when you're doing a torch examination. And you can also see that the eye basically, or the conjunctiva does not really have any congestion. The other vessels are pretty much normal because it's not going to incite a, a lot of inflammatory reactions in area where there is no subconscious hemorrhage because all you basically need are those macrophages coming in and clearing out this area. So you might get some congestion in this area, but you can't see it because it's covered by a hemorrhage. So an eye which has a subconjunctival hemorrhage has this uh, uniformly uh, type of uh, um, hemorrhage or accumulation of blood, which obscures conjunctival uh, details. Sometimes all of the conjunctiva might have a hemorrhage. So like in this eye, nearly all of the conjunctiva has a subconjunctival hemorrhage. So these are examples of conjunctival and other types of growth that you see. And this one right at the limbus is something that's uh, called an episcleritis. It's a little congested raised nodule uh, because it's signifying inflammation. And this one, which is sort of, uh, might be a little difficult to see, but if you look carefully, this is this little yellowish nodule here. This is basically called a pingicula. So episcleritis is basically the one on the left is coming from episclera, which is the layer just below the conjunctiva again over the sclera, and both of these are transparent. That's why it's called episclera above the sclera. So inflammation of episcleritis can present in various ways of which uh, one is in this form, a little nodule, uh, which has bits of inflammation around it. And pingicula is basically degeneration of conjunctiva. It's, it's basically something that happens because of uh, environmental exposures. We'll do this when we talk about conjunctiva proper, but right now uh, these pictures are here to basically uh, show you how conjunctival growths and other growths uh, or swellings can appear uh, on a torch examination. So this one's an episcleritis, inflammation of episclera. It can be of other types, but one of them is a nodular type, and this is a pingicula. Now we'll talk about cornea, and cornea generally is clear. Uh, when I mean clear, uh, now we'll talk about cornea and various corneal lesions that you can see uh, while you're doing a torch examination. And cornea is generally clear, uh, a normal cornea is clear, and it does not have any blood vessels on it. So you can get various types of corneal lesions depending upon uh, what has happened to the cornea from something that's just a corneal erosion. And erosion is when you just lose the epithelial layers of your cornea. And as you can see right here, this little bit that uh, my, my pointer is going over is an area where the cornea has lost its epithelium and you can see the margin of the area of the cornea where the epithelium is lost. And these are called corneal erosions. They're not accompanied by a lot of inflammation because uh, the epithelium has a lot of self-regenerating capacity and it can pretty much fill this defect uh, within 24 to 48 hours and can pretty much go, go back to being of its normal strength and, and integrity uh, in about five to seven days. This, however, the second picture, picture B, is showing you areas of corneal infiltration, which is signified by this creamy looking lesion. So this is a keratitis and, and this is accompanied by a corneal ulcer. You can't see an ulcer because the ulcer is sort of uh, obscured by all of this infiltration that's going on. Uh, you can also see some very fine blood vessels going onto the surface of the cornea and the cornea does, is, does not normally have these. Again, these are in response to this inflammation of the cornea, keratitis, and these new vessels are called famous. You also see a little bit of inflammation of the conjunctiva right around the limbus. 
and this is called circumcorneal congestion. All of this is because of this lesion right here, and this would be explained more when we talk about keratitis uh, later in the clerkship, but right now it is here to, to demonstrate to you how an ulcer might appear on a torch examination. You also see something here, right here. Uh, this is not in the cornea, this is actually in the interior chamber. The interior chamber is the space between the cornea and the iris, so this is basically within the eye, and this is all the dead neutrophils and whatever infective, if this is an infective ulcer, infective agents cause this inflammation, and when they are dying, uh, because of the severity of the inflammation together with dead defense cells accumulate in the interior chamber, and this is called a hypopion. So you can also see a hypopion during a torch examination, and they're very frequently associated with uh, severe uh, corneal ulcers. So this is a corneal ulcer uh, and keratitis. You can't basically see the margins of the ulcer because of all the infiltration. Infiltration are all your defense cells coming in and fighting the whatever is causing the inflammation of the cornea, which is mostly an infection, but they can be non-infectious causes as well. You see new blood vessels growing onto the corneal surface. This is called famous. And you also see circumcorneal or limbal conjunctival congestion uh, again, in response to this inflammation, and you see a hypophion, which is pus collecting in the interior chamber, just dead organisms and defense cells. If this was an infective ulcer, then obviously dead organisms, otherwise just uh, defense cells uh, within the interior chamber. This is a corneal scar, and this is seen after uh, corneal trauma and is also seen as a sequelae of an ulcer. Ulcers always heal by scarring, erosions don't heal by scarring. They heal normally and your cornea is back to being normal within the time stream that we specified. The, the gap fills between 24 to 48 hours and the integrity of the cornea is restored between five and seven days. But if you have an ulcer or you have trauma, enough trauma in the eye, it might lead to a corneal scar. And I know this is a scar and not an infiltration because the eye is quiet, i.e. you don't see any other signs of inflammation. You don't see the redness that you see here. You don't see the fanness. And again, if present, you could have seen a hypophion if this was active. And again, there is nothing here. So I know that this is a scar. And finally, you might have depositions in the cornea. And this is called arcus senilis. This is in the periphery of the cornea. And this is because of deposition of various types of lipids. Uh, and you see this in advancing age, thus arcus senilis. It can also be seen in individuals who are younger than 40 years of age, and then it is termed arcus juvenilis. That is something that's not normal. Above the age of 40, you would see some deposition of fat. That's just because of aging. Uh, but seeing it in patients or people under 40 years of age can signify an underlying dyslipidemia uh, so that it needs to be properly investigated. So from erosions, to ulcers and keratitis, to scars, to arcosinilus, are various types of lesions that you see in the, in the cornea when doing a torch examination. Then we're coming to the iris, and the most important thing in the iris that you see is basically a difference in color. Now, it can be between the two eyes, as shown in the picture here, or it can be within the same eye as shown in these two pictures here. This is called heterochromia irides, or heterochromia irides. Irides is, I think, a little better, and this is basically a difference in color of the iris. Hetero meaning different, chromia meaning color. And most of the time, this is because of a disease process in the eye with the lighter color, or the quadrant of the iris, which has the lighter color. But it can sometimes also be normal that your iris has a lot of difference, especially between the two eyes. Uh, a difference, uh, a lot of difference in the color. The lesions or diseases that are usually responsible for creating uh, heterochromia in the eye is uveitis. Uh, the type of uveitis is iritis, which is inflammation of the iris, or acute angle closure, uh, spe specifically repeated attacks of acute angle closure. We'll do those when we do the red eye. Then you have abnormalities of shape of the pupil. And one very common abnormality that you see after trauma is called a teardrop pupil or a tadpole-like pupil. And this happens once you have a perforation in the cornea and a bit of the iris has prolapsed out of the perforation, as you can see right here, this yellow arrow. So the iris is prolapsed out 
of the perforation because remember the eye within the eye there is intraocular pressure it is high pressure and when you perforate the eye all of that high pressure is sort of lost and it pulls organs or structures within the eye outside not organs structures or tissues within the eye outside and iris is very flimsy it's very flimsy it's like as flimsy as a tissue paper and when you have a perforation it can simply come out as as the eye is sort of deflating uh, is secondary to the perforation. And as the iris is coming out, it, it pulls the pupil with it because a pupil is in the center of the iris and it takes on this tadpole like shape or a teardrop shape. The other anomaly is a more commoner anomaly is you see a dilated pupil. And dilated pupil is usually because a patient is using drugs, either for example, when you're trying to figure out a refractive correction, which we've already done by now, or it can also be because of trauma there is so much trauma to the eye that the iris muscles have simply stopped working because of the shock of the trauma. So blunt trauma, specifically blunt trauma, can cause a dilated pupil as well. So these are the various iris abnormalities that you can pick up on a torch. So now we are talking about the various uh, different presentations of the, the changes that you can see in the lens when you're doing a torch examination. And we start off with how a normal eye and adinexa would appear when doing a torch examination. And obviously this picture is here to show you the color of the normal lens, which is grayish green, which is shown right here. This is something that you can do at home by shining a light from the side and looking at yourself in the mirror in a low uh, sort of uh, room, which does not have very bright light. So your pupil is of an adequate size that you can see your lens comfortably, or you can see another person's lens who is in your house and who is of an age where you don't see cataracts, i.e. younger than about 50 years of age. So this is the normal color of a lens, which is grayish green. It's described as grayish green. I would call it just gray, but this is grayish greenish tinge that you get when you are doing torch examination of, uh, of a normal crystalline lens. A crystalline lens is the lens, uh, they're the same thing. B and C are showing you when the color of the lens changes, i.e. you are looking at cataracts, if you look at B, the lens is uh, more white as compared to A, which is a uh, cataract, which is sort of relatively earlier as compared to C, where the cataract is uh, completely white. So these are pictures of various uh, uh, types and stages of cataract. And finally, if you look at picture D, um, from a clear lens to various types of cataracts, we have reached a stage where we have remove the cataract after surgery and put an artificial lens called an intraocular lens within the eye, which appears when you're doing a torch examination as a shiny object in the eye. These lenses are basically made of a type of plastic called acrylic, and they reflect light very, very uh, much like a, a piece of glass does, a window pane glass, <clears throat> not a mirror. Uh, and, and they're very shiny. So when you're, sh you're moving your torch across the pupillary area, you get a very fine uh, uh, reflection of your illuminator, and you can tell that this is pseudophakia. It is really essential and important that when you are doing a torch examination, you can pick up all of these different types of presentations of the lens. So these are the various lesions that we, you can see during torch examination of the ocular edinexa as well as the eyeball. So now you'll see a demonstration video, and the demonstration video will try and cover these things that we, it does cover what, what we have done here, but sometimes you might not be able to hear what I'm saying, or I might not have uh, voc vocalized enough for you to be aware of what I said. Uh, I can tell you, for example, that uh, you might not hear me mention the lit crease or lit closure, but I am, I have checked for those things, and that is why this presentation is here. So do go over it, do see the demonstration, and do remember that you need to do both eyes. Since I was examining another doctor, and that doctor has been kind enough to allow herself to be examined for you, I sometimes only check one eye and not both eyes, but you're supposed to do the same thing in the other eye as well. Thank you very much. See the videos. If you have questions, you know where to ask them. WhatsApp group is the best place so that everybody uh, can benefit from your thinking. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Ali. Today I will be able to see your eyes from this torch. During the torch, the torch will go to your eyes, but it will not be a problem. If you have any pain, then tell me. Do you have any pain? Do you have any pain? Okay. If you look at it, you can see that it is written on the front of the screen. You have to look at it on the front of the screen.
और रोशनी की तरफ कोशिश करिए कि ना करें ठीक है सो द फर्स्ट थिंग आई टू डू इज टू चेक दैट विद्राउस shine the light at the bridge of the nose making sure it's the center and what you'll do is check the symmetry of the brow in the sense that we know are they at the same level once we are done with that we need to check each individual brow by sweeping the light over it and what we are looking for are scars swellings or loss of hair scars would tell you surgery or trauma swelling would tell you if there is inflammation or tumors or any other cause especially if it is a red or tender looking swelling and hair loss might lead to or tell you about endocrinological issues we do it for both eyes now that we have done the brow we're going to check the symmetry of the lips again by shining the light at the bridge of the nose and noticing the position of the upper lip and now that we are done with that what we are going to do is aap apni aankhein dono band kar lijiyega we are going to check each individual eyelid surface for scars or swellings and scars and swellings are again going to tell us the same things that they told us before trauma or surgery for scars swelling by indicating inflammatory processes or tumors or growths we are also going to check for the lashes and what we are going to do is check for um any deposits or loss of lashes or apni aankhein khol le When the patient's eyes open, we are going to look for the position of the hair on the upper and lower lid. The hair or the lashes on the upper lid point upwards and upwards. On the lower lid, they are going to point downwards and upwards. And we are going to do this for both eyes. And the surface of the lid was also checked for both eyes. Finally, we are going to check the medial canthal area or the tear drainage area, and we are going to be noticing any obvious discharge. various types trying to identify the nature of this chart as well as look for any swellings or scars uh, that might indicate trauma previous surgery or active inflammation and we are going to do this for both eyes notice that any test that's done for one eye has to be repeated for both eyes the only test that's specific to both eyes being tested at the same time with the symmetry of the brow and the lips aapka bahut bahut shukriya So what we have done so far is is the examination of the adenexa. We started off by examining the symmetry of the brows and then examining each individual brow for scars, discoloration, swelling, and hair loss. Then we moved on to examination of the eyelids. First, checking the symmetry of the eyelids by comparing the two. Then examining each of the eyes separately for the levels of the upper and lower eyelid. then we check the direction of the lashes a position of the lids to the eyeball and then finally we were checking for crusting or discharge um, uh, along the lashes then we check the eyelids with the eyelids closed we looked at the crease line then we looked for scars discoloration finally swellings at the lid margin as well as the lid surface then we check if the lids are appropriately closing the eyes and then finally had another look at the lashes if there were any crusting or discharge on them. Uh, the third area we examined was the lacrimal area or uh, and we looked for again scars, discoloration, swellings, uh discharge in this area or any fistulas or which might or might not be discharging a position of the lit to the eyeball. Uh so this is just a quick review of what we have done in this clinical method so far. Uh this is just a magnified view of the same and we are just looking for the same things. um this is how you record the information for uh, both eyes separately right and left eye and these are the things that we are noting and tabulating um as we go along and now what we'll do we will see uh, the demonstration of the clinical method of examining the eyeball and then we'll come back and have a little uh, review on it again assalam alaikum mera naam dr ali hai aaj main is torch ki roshni ki madad se aapki aankhon ka maina karunga मायने के दौरान थोड़ी सी रोशनी आपकी आंख में लगेगी लेकिन आपको कोई दर्द या तकलीफ नहीं होगी क्या आपकी इजाजत है आपको वो सामने ऊपर लिखा हुआ हाथ नजर आ रहा है आपने उसकी तरफ देखते रहना जब तक मैं आपको कहूँ नहीं कहीं और देखने के लिए ठीक है आप उसकी तरफ देखते रहें थोड़ी सी रोशनी अब आपकी आंख में लगेगी सो वेन यू आर डूंगेशन ऑफ दी आई बॉल वी बिगिन बाई एग्जामिनिंग दंजतली 
is to note that part of the conjunctiva is covered by legs, and obviously we will need to move the eye as well as the leg to properly examine the conjunctiva. Now, what do you want to do? My ungly is on the other side. Is it on the other side? My ungly is on the other side. Now, for the right eye, I can have a very good look at the temporal conjunctiva, and what I'm trying to look for are any growths, swellings, congestion, scars, hemorrhages, or areas which might <coughs> appear to have a lot of uh, inflammation. And I can check the temporal conjunctiva of the right eye and the nasal conjunctiva of the left eye. Notice that on the very medial side of the nasal conjunctiva, there is a sort of a membrane, and this is pretty much normal. So this is not an additional uh, feature. This is a normal feature. ठीक है अब आप इस तरफ से मेरी उंगली को देखिएगा सर सीधा रखिएगा मेरी उंगली को देखें and now we are repeating the test and looking at the left eye is temporal conjunctiva and looking for the same thing and we are going to look at the nasal conjunctiva of the right eye looking for the same thing ठीक है अब आपने ऊपर छत की तरफ देखना है मैं अपने हाथ से आपके आंखों की पलकों को थोड़ा सा हाथ लगाऊंगा आपको दर्द या तकलीफ नहीं होगी ठीक है क्या आपकी इजाजत है आपको यहाँ भी दर्द तो नहीं है ठीक है मेक श्योर आप सीधा ऊपर देखें यू नेल्स अच्छे योर हैंड्स आर वॉम ऊपर देखिएगा एंड यूज योर थर्म टू जेंटली फ्रॉम द लेग मार्जिन फोल द लेग डाउन यू डोंट हैव टू प्रेस टू हार्ड ऊपर देखते रहें एंड देन यू कैन सी दी इंफीरियर कंजेक्टाइवर ऑफ द आई बॉल द पल्पर कंजेक्टाइवर एंड यू कैन आल्सो हैव अ पीक एट द पल्परबल कंजेक्टाइवर ऑफ द लोअर लेग व्हिच अपीयर्स अ स्लाइटली मोर रेडर एस कंपेयर टू द बल्पर कंजेक्टाइवर एंड वी रिपीट दिस फॉर बोथ आईज ऊपर देखिएगा मैं दोबारा से आपकी आपकी पलक को बात करूंगा दर्द नहीं कोई जेंटली कोल द लेग फ्रॉम द लेग मार्जिन एंड हैव अ लुक एट द इंफीरियर कंजेक्टाइवर नीचे देखेगा पैरों को और मैं ऊपर की पलकों को सर सीधा रखिएगा नीचे देखें सुपीरियर कंजेक्टाइवर अगेन कोल फ्रॉम द लेग मार्जिन जेंटली मेक श्योर यू नॉट जैपिंग योर मेल इंटरप्रिटेशन नीचे देखिएगा The examiner knows okay, how well you are looking, so and how well you are holding your eyes. So don't cheat. And then we are looking for the same thing we did before. ठीक है. अब आप सामने दोबारा सीधा देखें. We now we are going to look at the cornea and we are looking at the cornea both straight on and obliquely. When we look at the cornea straight on, just look at the general clarity of the cornea and see if there are any opacities. And when you are also doing this, also see if you see any. Uh, depositions in the peripheral cornea in the form of a ring, which might be indicative of uh, arcus formation. Do slightly oblique, and some opacities would appear this better this way. And you can also see some uh, the deposition better. So we can do either this or straight, both of them, to check for arcus formation and opacities, and also any apparent blood vessels because the cornea. Does not have any blood vessels. Okay. Now what we want to do is to look at the iris, and this is again then weekly look at some see the bacteria, at the color of the iris generally. Remember, we are not doing pupillary reactions. Just look at the color of the iris of both eyes. Note the symmetry in color. Note any obvious changes in color, patches of pigmentation, and maybe any apparent large swellings. Finally, we are going to look at the lens, and what I want you to do at this time, or during the examination, is to see through the pupil and identify the color that you are seeing through it. The normal, and what you are seeing through the pupil is the lens. The normal lens appears grayish green in color. A cataractous lens would have a white tinge. If you are having trouble doing that with room lights open. You can turn the room lights on so that the pupil becomes marginally bigger, and as your illumination is mostly oblique, and if it's done properly, the pupil might be slightly larger than before, and you might get a better view. So, since my patient is a normal patient, I'm getting a very nice grayish, greenish color in both of my eyes. Now we are going to be examining the anterior chamber. After some days, we will take an anterior chamber depth, so the light is oblique. परपेंडिकुलर टू द प्लेन ऑफ द आयरस एंड यू शुड बी स्टैंडिंग इन फ्रंट ऑफ द पेशेंट सामने सीधा देखिएगा मैं आपके आगे आऊंगा लेकिन फिर भी कोशिश करिए कि आप सामने सीधा देखिए द आइडिया टू डू इज टू हैव अ वेरी गुड 
view of the entire iris and what you're trying to see can is the entire iris illuminated when I'm doing a perpendicular illumination and checking for interior chamber depth. See the deck here. This eye, the other eye, upper body wash. So I apologize, at the end of the video there was a phone call, so um, the last sentence, Aapka Baal Baal Shukriya sort of feels cut off. So anyways, when we were examining the eyeball, we started by looking at the conjunctiva, looking for discharges, congestion, hemorrhages, swelling and growth. And obviously because this is a demonstration of, of a method, first you start looking at normal before you start looking at abnormal. So we scanned all of the conjunctiva in all of the quadrants and we also had to touch the patient's eye. So we took proper permission before we did that, ensuring our hands were warm, nails were clipped. Uh, we looked at the cornea for clarity and also for avascularity, which is important. And we also looked at the limbus area to see if there were any deposits. Uh, we looked at the iris and the pupil, not to perform pupillary reflexes, just to see the color of the iris, the shape of the pupil, and a difference in color of the iris between the two eyes. Then we looked at the lens and whether it was of, if it was phacic, was it a normal lens or a lens that had a change in its color, pseudophacic or aphacic. Uh, then again, same thing, just a little magnified. This is how we were scanning the various quadrants of the conjunctiva. And then we did the anterior chamber depth by illuminating from the side, observing from the front. Uh, this is one of the few tests in which you can actually stand in front of the patient, but you're going to tell the patient where you're going to approach from. And what we were looking for is how the iris on the nasal side, the side opposite to our illuminator appeared, and normally it's supposed to be visible. And then we also notice this dark band, and you're going to find out why that is. So once you're done with all of this, we this is how you note the findings, and always examine both eyes. We then and and note them down properly. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you in the next video soon.